first time I've held one of these mics, so I was worried I was going to blast you out. Hey, I'm the library director for Ivy Tech, and I just want to thank you for taking time this evening to come out to Columbus Pass. Um, I am the library director for Ivy Tech, so I'm co-sponsoring with Phi Theta Kappa, and I'm honored that they're um, working with us on that. I do want to point out a very special guest this evening. We have lots of special guests, but one person in particular, um, Tony Morvac, is over here. Yes, Dr. Combs said yes. We invented it. Actually, um, sponsoring the Sundays that we have from Zaharico's today, and it's Build Your Own Sunday. So you better get to that table before I do, because I will probably be eating two or three. Um, but anyway, we just wanted to thank him for being here. I also want to thank our panelists this evening. Um, we have Dr. Iorio, um, Greg Lewis, Adam Redeker, and David Seacrest, and I'm so honored that each of them have come out to talk to you about Columbus Pass. Um, we're just really looking forward to that. The speaking order is going to be going historically. So we're going to have um, Dr. Iorio go first, and then that's followed by Greg Lewis, Adam Redeker, and then David Seacrest. Um, I believe I have that order right. Yes, they, they made a change at the last minute, and I'm never good at changes. So anyway, I wanted to mention that. And yeah, we just are really grateful for your attendance this evening. I wanted to make sure I'm not leaving anything out. Um, one thing I do want to mention is that we will be doing library tours after the event. So if you want to do a library tour, the library is actually open to not only our Ivy Tech, IEPC students, it's also open to the community. So you can get a library card and check out anything in our library that's available. So um, just wanted to mention that as an FYI, and that's why the library brochures are on the table. Um, and I think that's everything that I wanted to mention. I just I just wanted to mention those things. I do actually want to mention one more thing. I always have a one more thing. So the other thing that I wanted to bring to your attention is the evaluation. We would love to get your personal feedback on that this evening. So if you um, have some thoughts and you're like, okay, I didn't like this about the event, but I like that, um, please be honest. You don't have to put your name on it. Um, so I won't know who you are. And so just feel free to do that and enjoy the evening. Thank you so much for coming. Hi, good evening. Thank you all for coming. I hope that I don't um, make this difficult by not exactly um, the interview. We we're going to go in, in kind of a timely order. And you have four eager historians here who all have um, various areas of interest in local history. And each of the fine gentlemen who are going to follow me have a very specific interest that they're going to talk about. My interest in history really started as a postcard collector, and I'm interested in visual history, old photographs, vintage maps, per se. So I'm giving more of an overview that I hope kind of sets the scene for each of them. So to that end, I'm going to start with the original plat map from Columbus. So this is, uh, this is an undated map from sometime in the 1820s. Columbus became Columbus in 1821, and I think we'll hear a little bit more about that later when Greg talks about the founding of the county. A plat map was a map that was used when a town was set out to set out the basic uh, structure of the streets. And several things I want to highlight here. First of all, um, th this is a difficult one. I I've never found a really great, um, clear version of this map, so I apologize if it appears a little bit blurry. But our east-west streets are not numbered at this time. They all have names. Um, most specifically, 3rd Street, which is right here, was called Tipton Street. And then I want to point out two open areas. So this open area right here is the future courthouse square. So um, when the city was laid out, our city founders thought to leave a, an open space for a very important building later. And that's the, that was the home of our, our courthouse eventually. And then this space right here that we're also going to hear more about later, if you could read that, that says Mount Tipton. It was also called Tipton Knoll at times, and it was an open area up on a hill at the west end of 3rd Street. And we're going to learn a little bit more about that as well. So photography was basically invented around the 18, early 1840s, but didn't become common until 1860s, 1870s. This is the earliest known photograph that I have seen from Bartholomew County. Um, it's a duplicate photo because many of you are probably aware this is a stereo view. So stereo views were double views that you could use this 
nifty little viewer like this and look through and see a 3D image. And I showed this at a um, fourth grade, fourth and fifth grade talk a few weeks ago, and um, the children wrote me lovely thank you letters where they thanked me for showing them the first virtual reality. <laughs> But this is, of course, a picture of the courthouse being built. And our courthouse was built between 1871 and 1874. It was dedicated in 1874. Um, and here's a slightly later stereo view. So sometime between 1874 and 1875. Uh, the clock in the clock tower has obviously not been installed. And that was installed in 1875. There is a building that probably looks unfamiliar to many right behind the courthouse. It was built in a similar style around the same time. And that was the jail. The sheriff's headquarters were also there, and the sheriff and his family lived upstairs. And that building was present for almost a century. Um, when our courthouse was complete, um, it was called, quote, the finest in the West, unquote. And I love this picture. Um, if you haven't found your bearings yet, here's the courthouse over here. This is actually half of the stereo view as well. Um, but to me, this looks like a Wild West scene. I think it's kind of fun with the dirt streets and the buildings and the characters standing out here. But I include this to show you what's at the west end of 3rd Street. And here you can see in 1874, 1875, what Tipton Hill or Tipton Knoll looked like and um, the large home that was built on top of that. And that house was built around the same time as the courthouse, around 1875. Um, and of course, if you picture the same scene today, that house and that hill are not there. <laughs> and so, what happened? Um, these two pictures give a, a good, um, give you a good story as to why that's not there. So on the left, this is an unpublished Life magazine photograph from 1950. It's taken from Tipton Hill, um, and you can see the house has already been half torn down at this point. You can see the courthouse is out in the distance there. But the postcard on the right is from after that. It's a 1950s era postcard. Um, and so at this time, we didn't have a really easy way to get in and out of downtown. And so um, city leaders at the time decided to expand Third Street and build a new bridge over the river. And in order to do that, they had to tear down the home and the hill, which were about right there. So they took the house down, took most of the hill away, and extended Third Street out over the river. Uh, this is a bird's eye view map of Columbus from 1886, and many of you have probably seen a map like this. Um, they were incredibly common in the late 19th century and early 20th century. They were um, really considered works of art um, at the time, but these were maps that were drawn as if they were from uh, an altitude, and um, there were artists who traveled around the United States and walked street by street and sketched buildings and then went back to their rooms or their studios and put these maps together. They are not just scale, but the artists were expected to depict the buildings fairly um, um, accurately. And um, you know, one of the things you'll notice if you look at these maps is almost every town is, is shown to be very bustling. You know, every railroad track has trains on it. Every um, every river and creek has boats on it. There are people on the streets if you can see up to that close. Um, but this is this is fun to show um, how much change there was in Columbus between our flat map from 1821 or so in 1886, whereas that first map, Columbus extended north to about 6th Street. Now we're going north all the way to 16th Street. So this is 16th and Washington right here. That was the starch works, which was one of our um, industries at the time. And this treed area up here would be the future Donner Park. So it, it's fun because Columbus looks large, but as when I show school groups this, I always point out, you know, this is really, the whole town was basically smaller than downtown still at this point. Um, this is a close-up on the left um, of the Mill Race Park area um, from the 1886 bird's eye view map and then a, a, a map on the right just to, to kind of show the, the comparison for transportation coming in and out of Columbus. One of the things that I think we all four felt we were tasked with tonight is presenting some information that helps um, explain a little bit how Columbus developed the way it developed. And so one of, one of those um, important uh, areas would be transportation. And so our location at the confluence of the Driftwood and the Flat Rock Rivers um, was important, as was the railroads that came to town in the 1840s. So here's a close-up of where the two rivers come together to form the East Fork of the Wright River in Millrace Park. And there's a platform right there in Millrace Park where you can stand and see where the rivers come together. I also want to point out this waterway right here. This was the Mill Race. And that's, of course, where Mill Race Park got its name. But a mill race was a man-made narrow channel of water that was created to power mills and factories. And so we will um, 
we'll see in a minute exactly how industrial you know, Columbus was in the late part of the 19th century. But I want to point out that we had a bridge right here. This was called the 8th Street Wagon Bridge, and this is one of our factories right there. Um, the Pennsylvania Railroad Bridge was right here, and this was the one bridge in and out of downtown that was called the 2nd Street Wagon Bridge. Um, if you look at today, the 8th Street Wagon Bridge is long gone, but the, the location is very similar to where the Indianapolis Road Bridge today that's north of Mill Race Center is. If you look down here, there's a, a gray line that shows where the Pennsylvania Railroad Bridge still is. And then instead of one bridge going in and out of town that was a 2nd Street Bridge, we have the 3rd Street Bridge going out of town and the 2nd Street Bridge going into town. There's that 8th Street Wagon Bridge and the collection of buildings right here were, was the Crump Brickworks. And this is the same Crump family that um, we would all be familiar with from the Crump Theater. Uh, while the photos and maps I showed tonight really don't emphasize the, the people part of the history of Columbus, several important family names will come up and the Crumps would be one of them. F.J. Crump was one of the original settlers to, Colum to Bartholomew County in 1821. And, um, he was a very prominent businessman with all sorts of interests all around town. This is the view of that second street wagon bridge that was our one way in and out of town in the late 1800s and early 1900s with a picture of um, the waterworks or what David's gonna tell us about later, the pump house there. Um, if you could see behind this brush right here, you would see that the mill race that traveled through our future mill race park and powered our mills and um, that's where it came out, just north of the bridge and that becomes an important piece of information when we hear David's story in a few minutes. Um, and then here are two bridges by the same name in different locations. So on the left, again, is our 2nd Street Wagon Bridge from the late 19th century. And you can see it goes right into town, right by the pump house, which, of course, today is the Upland Brewery. And then our 2nd Street Bridge on the right, the Roman and Stewart Bridge that is farther south. This is another map um, from 1886. It's a different kind of map. Um, and I, it gives me different information that I think is fun as well. This is a Sanborn fire insurance map, and the Sanborn company began in the 1860s to create maps all over the country for different communities for fire insurance purposes. So this is a sample, this is the introductory map from 1886, and there are numbers throughout that correspond to different sheets that you can then look at to get more detail. But the maps would show details of what buildings were made of, where water sources were in the case of fire. Um, and so there is something on this map that relates to each of our speakers tonight. So here again is the mill race that empties out right here just north of the bridge and the waterworks that David's going to talk about in a little bit. Um, here we have Fifth Street, which is really where I'm going to concentrate the rest of my talk. I, 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 as I thought of how to focus and how to find the best images to show and share history, it, it hit me that right now while we have Exhibit Columbus going on downtown, really concentrated around Fifth Street, that talking about the history of Fifth Street and the families and the businesses that were there was a good way to, to give some background into our history. Um, and that includes at the end of the street, this right here, if you could read that, says Reeves Agricultural Company. So um, Adam's gonna give us a lot more information about Reeves, but in 1886, they were located right there, so. All right, so I'm gonna start at the west end of Fifth Street. So this is an artist's rendering of Mooney's Tannery. Mooney's was one of the many mills and factories that was downtown in the late 19th century. In the 1830s, Mr. Edmund Mooney started a tannery out in Nineveh Township. Nineveh Township was the farthest northwest township in Bartholomew County. It's where Camp Atterbury is today. In the 1860s, because of probably both the river, which was back here, and the railroad, um, Mr. Mooney moved the tannery into town, into the future Mill Race Park area. By 1890, this tannery was reported to be the largest tannery in the world, so producing all a uh, variety of leather, boots, belts, harnesses, saddles, etc. Um, the tannery was in existence in, in, in that area for approximately 100 years, and then the building was torn down in 1963. And the next picture, I'm jumping ahead a few decades, but I want to show you exactly how close Looney's Tannery was to downtown. So this picture is from the early 1940s. It's taken from the bell tower of First Christian Church after it was built. And this is looking west down Fifth Street. So you can see Old City Hall right here in the Irwin block. But this brick building here right at the end of Fifth Street is Mooney's Tannery. So it wasn't up against the river, it, it was up against downtown. And so to imagine what it would have been like to be downtown, uh, I like this photograph. This is an 1890s bird's eye view, actual photo taken from the courthouse, looking to the northwest, and this is the cereal line building right here to get your, to kind of give you some ideas of where, where we are here. So 
to me, this picture just really shows how industry was also was already driving Columbus in the late 19th century by looking at all the smokestacks and, and smoke coming from all over. In the distance down here, this is the starch works. And this is fun to look at this little road going out there. That's what goes to that 8th Street wagon bridge and the front brick works that we saw before. Um, the Syria Line building, um, I, I include this even though it's a little bit um, off of 5th Street because I think it's such a great example of repurposing a building. We are obviously known for our modern architecture from the last 60 or 70 years, but there are great examples around town of some of our historic buildings from the 19th century that are still standing, most of which then have been repurposed. And, and so the Syria Line building, which was a working mill in the 1880s, but was closed um, you know, after not very many years, is a good example because as it was incorporated into Cummins corporate office building in the 1980s. All right, and so now we started at Mooney's Tannery. We're going to move east down Fifth Street. We're going to concentrate on the intersection of Fifth and Washington Street. So oops, first I'm going to show you this again. So this is where we're talking about. This is, again, looking down Fifth Street, and here's Washington. And we're going to look at this corner and this corner and this corner. And of these three corners, only one of these buildings is still standing. So this is a picture from 1900, and many of you probably have heard that the current Viewpoint Books building, which is uh, north of here, was uh, Columbus Old Post Office but it was our old post office not until 1900. And prior to that, in the 1890s, 4th and Washington Street was our city post office. And you can see these letters right here, POS, so the edge of the post office. This is a photo taken in 1900. And this um, gentleman, his name was Walter Daup, and he was the city bill poster. And his granddaughter is here today, correct? Correct, yep. This is all brand. Um, on the, in the bottom corner, you can see a picture, a more recent picture of, of of the same corner. In, because I want to stay true to the theme that this is Columbus then, none of my current pictures are actually current pictures. They're all at least five years old. But this picture in the bottom right, <laughs> the bottom right corner is from the 1960s. But this, of course, is the current Irwin Conference Center, which um, was Irwin Union Bank at the time this picture was taken. Um, across the street, so we are on the northeast corner of Fifth and Washington. On the top, you can see the Evening Republican Building. So this brings up another one of our prominent early families. The Brown family founded a weekly newspaper in 1872, and it became a daily newspaper in 1877. Um, they had moved to this building at the corner of Fifth and Washington by 1890. Um, it's, I didn't really show it to you in the map, but the railroad came directly right across there, which is why if you can sort of see from this perspective, that building was cut off. Um, and then down below is a, a picture from a few years ago of, of, of the bank building that is there today. And then diagonally across the street, that's the building that is that is um, that remains standing on the corner of Fifth and Washington. So up above, we have a, a postcard from the St. Dennis Hotel, which was built around 1875. Um, the hotel originally had a tower, which was removed sometime in the 1920s after a bank called Union Bank purchased the building. Um, the hotel continued in part of the building after that, and the U Union Trust, excuse me, um, occupied part of the first floor. Union Trust is what merged eventually with Irwin Bank to become Irwin Union Bank for most of the 20th century. So this is another 1890s photograph. It is a partner photograph to the one I showed a couple minutes ago. The other one was looking towards the Syria Line building, so looking northwest. This photo is looking northeast, and this is the best way, I think, to get um, an idea about the history of this area right here. So where I'm pointing, this block is where First Christian Church stands today. So we are looking from the courthouse this direction, and the buildings that you might recognize, this is the Story Home, which is today our visitor center. And this right here is the Irwin home, so currently a bed and breakfast. There are several churches in this photo that are um, still standing. First Presbyterian is back here, St. Bartholomew is back here, and First Methodist is way back there. But what I wanna point out here, we, we don't have Old City Hall yet because this photo was taken in 1890 and Old City Hall was not built until 1895. We don't have any church where First Christian stands. In fact, we have a railroad square here. So originally, the railroad cut directly through downtown, and um, this area was called Railroad Square. That did not last for a very long time because Columbus citizens didn't appreciate the noise and the um, disruption of having the trains go directly through downtown. So that area was then later cleaned up and turned into a park. Um, we also don't have a library yet, but we have a big church right here that's no longer standing. And um, many of you are maybe familiar with the history of that area. That was called the Tabernacle Church of Christ. 
Um, and that was the forerunner to First Christian Church. It was the congregation of the Tabernacle Christian Church that built First Christian Church, which actually was called the Tabernacle originally. So um, here's one more building that is recognizable that most uh, many Columbus um, residents have always called the White Star Building. This is the same view about 20 years later. So this time you can see the old city hall has been constructed, which was built in 1895, and the Irwin Block right here. Now we have an open green area here. After Railroad Square was cleaned up, it became a city park for a while until the church was built. And across the street, we still see the tabernacle, but we also um, have a library. And I'll show you a picture of that coming up here. Um, there's a comparison from, from the 1890 picture and um, a more recent picture down below looking from the courthouse. And so the, the buildings that are visible in both views are First Presbyterian Church, the White Star Building, St. Bartholomew, and First Methodist Church. Uh, the Story Home, which is the visitor center again, and the Irwin Home are in both views, but not visible in the, in the more recent view because of the trees and, and the greenery. Here are two views of the park that took the place of Railroad Square. So we're on Fifth Street right across from the library today where First Christian Church stands. And up above, if you picture yourself standing in the courtyard of First Christian Church and, um, and looking towards Old City Hall, you can see that building standing right there. And then if you turn your body 90 degrees and look the other direction, you can see this is where the library is today, and there's the library at the time with the tabernacle standing in the background. So this park had several different names. There are lots of postcards from the early 20th century that show this park. It was sometimes called Central Park, sometimes called Commercial Park, and sometimes called City Park. Um, and here is a picture of our library. Like many communities around uh, the United States, Columbus had a Carnegie Library. Um, citizens um, wrote to Andrew Carnegie, who donated $15,000 to build the library. At the time, there was some question as to whether they should write back to Mr. Carnegie and ask for more money, because that didn't seem like enough. But um, they were able to build the library right at the corner of um, Fifth Street and Lafayette. And at the time, Lafayette was called Mechanic Street. But um, it, was, it was right at the corner, and Lafayette, the, the, the road at the time, went all the way through. Of course, when our current library was built in the 1960s, Lafayette was closed off to, to utilize more space there. But, um, and, and the library at the time was also built very much up right on Fifth Street. It's a fun fact I like to show um, school kids, too. The shape of the building, if, it, if, if no one's ever pointed that out before, it was built to look like a book standing on its side, but open. So you've got the front cover right here and the back cover here with the spine right there and the door and the spine. Um, right next door to the library, of course, is the Irwin Home. These are both postcards. The postcard up above is from the 19-teens and down below from the 1940s. To me, this is a, a really, these are fun views to compare because at the top, you can see the old tabernacle in the background and at the bottom, you can see the new church, which was still called the tabernacle at the time. But the Irwin home um, was built in the 1860s by Joseph Irwin, who was, again, one of our um, prominent early citizens, um, was the great-grandfather of um, J. Irwin Miller and um, uh, the father of W.G. Irwin, who was one of the co-founders of Cummins. But the home was built in 1864. It was renovated um, 20 years later. The sunken gardens were not added until the 1910s. Um, and so then again, you can see two different views of the home, which is um, thankfully still standing. Here are two pictures of First Christian Church. And First Christian Church deserves a, a nod as our first modernist um, building to bring Columbus to prominence. This was built, um, it was finished in 1942. And the Irwin family, of course, both W.G. Irwin and J. Irwin Miller um, were involved in this. This, I think, on the left is a fun picture because many people don't know that the original design of the church, um, the original serenade design included a reflecting pool, which wasn't there for very long. It's also fun because the old tabernacle is still standing at the time. So it's one of the only pictures I've seen where you can see the old church and the new church in the same view. And then on the right is a more, um, more recent picture where you can see the library and Henry Moore's large arch in the background. Of course, today, if we saw these pictures, we would see um, some of the wonderful exhibit Columbus sculptures. If we stand right between the library and First Christian Church and keep looking east, we can see um, an old view of the Irwin home and then a couple of the historic homes that are still standing on Fifth Street as well. And um, the next block brings us to the Reeves family. And Adam's going to tell us a lot about the Reeves family, but at one time, um, the Reeves family had five homes in the 700 to 900 block of uh, Fifth Street. 
These are two of the homes. The one up above was one of Columbus's earliest hospitals as well. It was called Columbus Sanitarium between 1909 and 1917. 1917, not coincidentally, was when Bartholomew County Hospital opened on 17th Street, so we didn't need um, this building to serve as such anymore. That, that building was then purchased by the H.C. Whitmer Company in 1921 and was used to manufacture medicines um, for quite a while after that. These, most of these Reeves homes were torn down then when Lincoln School was built um, um, uh, in the late 20th century. Right across the street from where the Reeves home stood was um, the old St. Peter's, and I have a um, postcard up above and then a photo down below that's more, um, that's more uh, recent. I include this because many people today don't even remember the old St. Peter's Church, but um, this was called German Lutheran Church when it was built. It was built in the 1870s, and I, this is another fact I like to share when I talk to school groups, that many of us um, have great pride in the fact that Columbus is a very international flavor. We have people from all over the world that come to work and live here, and um, I like kids to know that that's been the case for quite a while. In the middle of the 19th century, there was a very large German population in our area, when this church was built, there were five German Lutheran congregations in the county, um, and this was one of them. And um, again, I mentioned I was a postcard collector originally, and um, several of my postcards from German Lutheran Church in the early 1900s are all still in German, so. And I'm gonna end our trip down Fifth Street. I can show you right here at the end. This again is, um, at the top was the original Reeves building downtown. So. Um, Adam's going to tell us about the two different companies that the Reeves family was responsible for, um, but their agricultural implements company was first at the end of this street. It was 5th and Wilson Street. Um, they later had a much larger building complex on 7th Street, but that's really, um, he will take off and, and, and help us understand how Reeves was important to the development of Cummins, which, of course, um, we're not going to talk very much about Columbus today, but obviously Cummins is such a huge part of Columbus today that it bears a mention to how, um, how we got to where we are. At the end of Fifth Street in the middle of the 20th century, um, this was uh, a Cummins building, and it shows a picture today of what that area looks like. And Cummins, of course, was incorporated in 1919, so we're still not talking about recent history, but um, that's where we ended at, at, at the east end of uh, Fifth Street. So, I'm going to get out of the way and let um, my co-speakers come with this picture just to get you excited about your Zaharika's ice cream that you get in a little while. High School. I'm the uh, Social Studies Department Chair at Easton Central. I see Candy Carr over here. I've got to give her a shout out because um, she asked me one time, some of you may know I portray presidents every year for President's Day, and one time she said, hey, do you know who John Tipton is? And I said, uh, he's like the founder of Columbus or something, and she said, I think you look like him. Would you be interested in portraying him? And so that was sort of the uh, um, sort of my entry point into learning more about John Tipton. Didn't know much about Bartholomew other than he was the namesake of our community. So um, I decided to do something a little bit about uh, the namesake of our of our county, Joseph Bartholomew, and then also the founder of Columbus. Um, but I didn't want to do just a standard, okay, this is their lives and everything like that. So I, I got to thinking about it and I, and I decided I wanted to call it 
uh, where are John Tipton and Joseph Bartholomew? And I thought I'd start with this image right here, because somebody in our community loved history so much that they went to, um, went there. Um, there's the pump house, of course. Uh, now up and you can see, Tony, you can see your shine there, yes. <laughs> uh, anyway, this is a six ton slab of Indiana limestone. And this image that I just showed you used to be right there. Um, and I've actually covered it over because I was certain, back in 2014, somebody loved history so much that they pried that and one, of, and one of the great things I love about doing these things is I learn so much in the process of it. So today I learned how to figure the weight of a bronze plaque, among other things. It well, weighs well over 100 pounds. And they pried that thing off because they loved history so much that they wanted to take it home. And I don't think that was the case. But anyway, its estimated value was $10,000. And it was pried off, and it's not there anymore. So that was sort of my entry point into where are Tipton and Bartholomew, kind of. Um, but so, but I, so I rode my bike over there the other day. I ride my bike around town a lot. I rode my bike over there the other day, certain that I was going to take a picture, and it was going to be this big blank space that you could probably see where the old plaque was. Um, but they replaced it. Um, and I'm happy that they did, but I hope we get a plaque back there because this is it. It's a photograph of the old plaque, and they've covered it over with a piece of plexiglass, and you can't really get You can actually see me and my bicycle there. And the <laughs> um, anyway, I'm happy. So the original thing was I was going to show that piece of limestone without the plaque, thinking, okay, what happened to them? But it goes a lot beyond that. So I'm going to start now with looking at General Joseph Bartholomew. Um, as you can see from the plaque, it says, uh, our county bears his name. He is our namesake. Um, and so I want to ask the question, where is Bartholomew today in Bartholomew County? Obviously, we're the only county in the United States named Bartholomew uh, because of him. And, uh, but in what other ways is Bartholomew evident here in our county besides the name? There is a portrait. Yeah, I'm going to get there. Um, yeah, I will get there. <laughs> uh, anything else? Some, if you open up the yellow pages, you'll find lots of business names, and you'll see lots of county offices. But there's not a ton, really. Um, you, could go on the, you could go on the courthouse square, and you could go to the Revolutionary War Soldiers Memorial. You wouldn't find his name. He was a, a veteran of the... Um, Revolutionary War. But the fact of the matter is, is he never ever settled here. You could go and try, you could go to his tombstone, which is a modern tombstone, and it's not in Bartholomew County either. And the fact of the matter is that he never really, he never lived here. Um, but he passed through here a bunch of times. And he played an important role in the founding of our, of our state. Um, and so we're going to find out just a little bit of background about him. Uh, how he got to be the namesake of our community. So here we go. He was born in 1766 in New Jersey. When he was about five, they moved to his family moved to southwest central Pennsylvania in an area called Laurel Hill. His father died after that. Um, in 1788, he got married and he moved to Louisville, Kentucky, with his wife. Um, about four miles actually east of Louisville, which is pretty cool because. Um, that's right where I grew up in Louisville, so right in that same general vicinity, but I don't know uh, if there was any evidence of him from that time. Interestingly, um, in 1798, he did what so many others did, and they crossed the Ohio River. Um, and I want to give a little shout out, a little plug here for um, one of the things I learned. So I've got some resources I brought along with me. Um, so if you want to read more about Indiana history, uh, James Madison is an IU uh, prof emeritus, professor emeritus of uh, Indiana history of history at IU. And he's like the preeminent Indiana historian. He wrote The Indiana Way in the mid-80s. 
It's a, it's a good read, but he's updated it in 2016 with Hoosiers, um, A New History of Indiana. One of the things if you read this, you'll read that Indiana was settled primarily from south to north. And so now I gotta give um, Dr. Iorio a shout out because she provided me with a really great resource, David Rumsey's. Um, uh, it's a database of historic maps that uh, are downloadable. That's so why I included a couple in here. And so before I talk about that, this came out of another book that was written for the Bicentennial. I'm wearing my Bicentennial tie, by the way, um, which is Hoosiers in the American Story. This was written by James Madison and an educator which was specifically for the Bicentennial. It's got some great stuff, and that's where I took this, um, this map from. And I just got to, I have to mention that we're called Indiana because at one time it was the land of the Indians. And so uh, you have to acknowledge that. Let me back up really quickly, though. One thing I forgot to mention about um, Bartholomew is that by the age of 10, he had already... Um, had become a master rifleman. And at the age of 10, 17, 1776, he actually joined the Pennsylvania militia and was, uh, you know, traipsing around Pennsylvania backwoods looking for marauding Native Americans who were allied with the British. And so that's why he could have been on our um, memorial to Revolutionary War veterans who are buried in Bartholomew County, but he never lived here, okay? But anyway, so at one time, this is a great map just because it shows the major Native American groups that lived here. Um, by the age of 18, Bartholomew had become a certified or a well-known Indian fighter. I'm using quotations there because, um, and he and Tipton both made much of their, um, you know, much of their state claim to fame was uh, based on the fact that they were um, well known for their fighting Native Americans. Anyway, so now I want to get back to the, the part about the map. So this is a map that Tammy showed me, which is, shows Indiana in 1817, uh, one year after statehood. We became the 19th state in 1816. And you'll notice that there is no Bartholomew County there. You can see uh, Jackson County right there, and then this giant county called Delaware. Um, and so, and Bartholomew County doesn't exist yet. And then in 1824, after Bartholomew County was founded in 1821, this map does not show Bartholomew County yet, but what I'm trying to show here is how Indiana was settled from south to north. Um, Kentucky had filled up, Kentucky became the 15th state in 17, 92, and already there was population pressure, and so people started flowing over, or you know, coming over the river, and then settling southern Indiana, and then moving northward. This shows 1827, and you can see the formation or the the uh, establishment, the founding of different counties. Now here is Bartholomew County. You'll notice there's no Brown County, and Bartholomew County is much larger than uh, than it is today. And then by 1831, uh, you see that it's extended uh, up into the Wabash River Valley. And this is also part of Tipton's story, so stay tuned. And then by 1834, further north, 1836, further north yet again. Um, at this point, this territory up here is being reserved still for the Potawatomis and the Miamis who just keep getting pushed further and further north. That's also part of Tipton's story. This is 1841, and then 1857, the state's pretty well filled out. But anyway, I just like this. Um, she showed me this, this resource, and I thought I should incorporate it, just because when I read the Indiana way, you know, I learned about that's the primary way that Indiana was settled, and I thought this was a great way to show it in maps. Let's get back to General Bartholomew. Um, in 1811, he was appointed a lieutenant colonel uh, of the Clark County Militia, where he lived near Charlestown. Um, and so his rendezvous with destiny occurred on November 7, 1811 at the Battle of Tippecanoe um, as part of um, territorial governor and 
General um, uh, William Henry Harrison's uh, army there. And so there's William Henry Harrison. He was both a territorial governor and general. Um, and there, of course, is Tecumseh and his brother, Tenskwatawa. One of the things I learned in my research is that there was a bunch of names for him. Um, Elms Tekawa and all these other ones, but uh, this is the one that most people know him by. They had created Prophetstown. Um, they're up near, uh, on Tippecanoe Creek, up near uh, modern day Lafayette. Um, and so Harrison's army went, met with uh, the Native Americans there on November the 6th. How, and it looked like the Native Americans were going to uh, negotiate with them the next morning uh, at 4 a.m. Uh, here's a, it's just a whole series of, of diagrams that show it um, that um, they were up on a hill, and that is uh, Harrison's encampment. And at 4 a.m. down here, the Native Americans attacked kind of going back on what they had said that they were willing to negotiate. Um, you'll notice that right here is Bartholomew, and Bartholomew had his, his troops there. He had told them to stand on guard, and uh, there was a fierce fight that occurred, and I think uh, John Tipton in his journals said that 157 Americans were killed or wounded, which was a pretty high um, casualty rate, but it was considered to be a great victory for the Americans. Um, so in the, and there's one last uh, diagram. Now one thing that's really interesting about that is that um, Bartholomew's not the only hero uh, of the Battle of Tippecanoe. Um, so Bartholomew County, Davies County, Du Bois, Owen, Spencer, Warwick, White, and Whitney. Now one thing that's important is that Spencer was the captain of John Tipton, Spear Spencer, and he was killed as were his two lieutenants. John Tipton was just an ensign and was promoted to major at the end of that battle because he fought so well. In addition, we have two counties, uh, Harrison, obviously named after um, William Henry Harrison and Tippecanoe, and later on, Tipton County, stay tuned, um, will be named after that. All right, so then uh, he fought in the War of 1812, then he got into politics, uh, Indiana General Assembly, Indiana Senate, uh, in 1820, he was uh, okay. In 1820, he was then a commissioner of a committee to cite the new state capital. And during that time, they traveled along the Driftwood River with John Tipton, and that will bring us back again to uh, our founding. In 1830, back home, um, he lost ten thousand dollars on a, he had been a bondsman on somebody else's land deal. It went bad. He lost all his money, and so then in 1831, he moved to Illinois. Clean County, Illinois, farm, lived quietly the rest of his life. He got a, a pretty good, uh, at the Battle of Tippecanoe, he took a shot to his right arm that broke both arms, broke both bones in his uh, right forearm. And uh, the government gave him a disability that he had to collect in southern Indiana. So he would, every year, he would ride on horseback from McLean County, which is where modern day Bloomington, Illinois is, all the way down to southern Indiana and collect it. And he would go through, after Bartholomew County had been uh, formed, he would very proudly ride through our county. So it's kind of an interesting thing. In 1840, he campaigned for his former general, William Henry Harrison, for president. Um, there is, um, he, he campaigned all over Indiana and Illinois. There's a campaign poster for that. William Henry Harrison used the Battle of Tippecanoe then as a launching point for um, uh, his political career, and Joseph Bartholomew campaigned right up until the very last day, and then on, he felt ill on election day, November 2nd, uh, 1840, and then he passed away the next day, November 3rd, 1840, and he is buried in McLean County, um, Illinois. So that's why you won't find Bartholomew here. All right. So. Where you will find him, as Mrs. Carr mentioned, is you will find him in two places. This is over the, uh, and I took, this is a recent picture, I just took it two days ago. Um, this is a portrait that is over the fireplace in the archives office of the Bartholomew County Courthouse. 
And I went in there and they allowed me to take that picture. And then I got with Adam over at the Indiana Historical Society and they also have, this is a copy of the other one. That's the way I think we, yeah. I think this is a copy, I, I read about it. This is the copy, yeah. And this is at the um, Bartholomew County Historical Society at the museum. So I got a picture there too. All right, now, what about John Tipton? Uh, he is said to be the founder of Columbus, Indiana. And there is a portrait of him that I'll talk a little bit more. But I've got, you see there, founder of Columbus in quotations. Um, Tammy mentioned earlier that this is Tipton Knoll at the end of what is today 3rd Street. Um, and so what do we have of Tipton today? Well, of course, we've got the Tipton Bridge, as Tammy mentioned. We've got Tipton Lakes. We've got Tipton Lakes Athletic Club. There's a Tipton Lane. Um, we have a portrait. I took this at the Bartholomew County Historical Society as well. We have a, this is a lith lithograph portrait. Uh, there's one up in Logansport as well. But you won't find him buried here either. Um, and so let's talk just a little bit about that. So Tipton was born in eastern Tennessee, what is today Sevier County, down around the area of uh, Pigeon Forge and, and Gatlinburg uh, in 1793. Uh, also, I have to give a shout out to George Pence. He was a, a 19th century historian who uh, is written, who has written extensively or wrote extensively extensively in the creation of this book, The Bartholomew County History, um, part one. And in it, he states that no one played a more important role in the, basically the founding of Indiana than John Tipton. That's what he said, kind of interesting. Uh, John Tipton was not well educated formally, uh, which is very interesting. You can go to the Bartholomew County Library and go into the Indiana room, and in the reference section, there is a three volume set of the John Tipton papers. And uh, the John Tipton papers are a fascinating read because when you begin reading them, they are not, they're like tons of horrible writing. I mean, <laughs> really, really bad. But then as you proceed and go on, he gets so much better. Um, so he obviously was uh, an ambitious man. What I love about Tipton is that um, he's a, uh, he's just, he encapsulates what I think is the best about the American spirit, sort of self-made man. Anyway, in 1793, his father was killed uh, by Cherokees. And then, uh, like uh, Bartholomew and like so many others, he came to um, Indiana and settled in uh, Harrison County, uh, Indiana. Uh, of course, William Henry Harrison was the territorial governor. Um, in 1810, he became a justice. The peace he got involved in, um, in, in, in politics as well. And he also was uh, required to become a member of the Harrison County Militia, which were known as the Yellow Jackets, because they wore distinctive yellow jackets. Um, and then that brings him in to the Battle of Tippecanoe. He was uh, uh, an ensign under Spear Spencer. Uh, and after Spear Spencer was killed and both of his lieutenants, he fought bravely and led bravely. And so then, after he was killed, he was made captain of the 5th Regiment of the Indiana Militia. And then he rose quickly through the Indiana Militia all the way up to Major General. And that's why we call him General, General John uh, Tipton. So, uh, getting back, in 1816, he was elected sheriff of Harrison County. In 1818, he was uh, named the commissioner to find a new seat uh, to relocate the um, Owen County seat, and then in 1820, along with John Bartho Joseph Bartholomew, he was uh, selected uh, to find a new capital site for Indiana, then elected to the Indiana General Assembly, and then he was also a commissioner to find a new, to actually mark the new boundary between Indiana and Illinois. Um, but then, in May of 1920, as they were looking to um, find, you know, locate the new site of the capital at, at Indianapolis. They came along the east bank of the uh, Driftwood River up in northwest Bartholomew County, somewhere in the area of what used to be Union or Nineveh townships, which are no, no longer exist because of Atterbury. He wrote in his journal, you can find it on page 196 of volume one, he, he wrote, good land, good timber, and, no, sorry, good land, good water and timber, describing this area. And he was an opportunist and he had bought up a lot of land 
in this area. He was a land speculator. And so after the formation, or when the county was formed, um, in 1821, he recommended that it be named after his uh, former general, uh, you know, his former Indian fighter, you might say, um, Joseph Bartholomew. And then the city was founded on February 15, 1821, and it was called Tiptona. Now you'll find it also mentioned sometimes that it's Tiptonia, but it's Tiptona. It's Tiptona is what it is. Okay, and there it is right there. And so you'll find this on the courthouse square as well. You see it right there. Um, and it says right there that uh, after Tipton, local elected commissioners renamed it Columbus 36 days or so after naming it um, Tiptona. It's unclear. There's nothing in the historic record that says why. Uh, it may have been he had divorced his first wife. Some, some has suggested it might have been that. It may have been that he was just getting on too quickly. Some have suggested, uh, which I think is inaccurate, about a political difference. Some have said that there were Whigs in power at the time, but Whigs didn't exist in the 1820s, and so, um, and Tipton eventually was a Jacksonian Democrat, so I don't think that's correct. I think that, I really don't know why it happened, but what did happen is he left Columbus, and, uh, and then he went on to, you know, greener pastures, you might say. Now, really quickly, I just want to mention this. This was from uh, a 2004 Republic article that calling him the founder of Columbus, that he donated the land has been called into question because they found a, a deed of sale, um, either a thousand or two thousand um, dollars. And so that deed disproves the Tipton gift. I gotta give a shout out to Harry, um, such a loss of, obviously to our community. Um, Harry chimed in on it and said that it was consistent with his character. He didn't, I don't think he thought too highly of Tipton um, based on that. So. Um, Anyway, I have some great stories about Harry, too, I, but I won't take the time. Uh, this is the original plat, and uh, as Cammy mentioned earlier, of course, 3rd Street was Tipton uh, Street at one time, and that's where Tipton Knoll, or Mount Tipton was. Um, and then moving on, so what he did was he left, and I think he left because of the opportunity. One of the more lucrative federal positions was to be an Indian agent, and he left to go become the Indian agent uh, located in Fort Wayne. It was quite lucrative. And it sh so shows sort of this conflicted attitude about Native Americans because now he is trying to, um, you know, it's a money-making opportunity. And so rather than trying to fight them, he's trying to cooperate with them and take their land and all that kind of stuff. So um, in 1826, he engineers a couple of treaties with the Miami and Potawatomi, which move them further west. And so as a result of that, he relocates the Indian Agency he gets the, the country to relocate the uh, Indian Agency to Logan's Port, which is right there. And then in 1831, by this time he is, this is a really a great story because by 1831 he's been recognized for his leadership and he's elected to fill the, un, the, the now vacant Senate seat of uh, James Noble. And then in 1832 he's re-elected in his own right. And in 1838 though, because of the Indian Removal Act and because the final bits of the Potawatomi are up here now, he is um, charged with removing them. And that becomes known as the Trail of Death. And this is just a little diagram of the Trail of Death in which they go from the Twin Lakes area all the way to um, here in eastern Kansas. I think it's kind of misnamed, only, only, it's a horrible thing, but 40 um, Native Americans died, mostly children. Uh, I think that if you switch the names, obviously the Trail of Tears, which everyone knows, um, far greater death toll on the, on the uh, Trail of Tears than the Trail of Death. Okay, so um, in 1839 he completed his uh, Senate term, and then he died right after that in Logansport. So um, he probably could have stood for re-election, but anyway, so, but then he didn't get his town name here, but then later on he did, of course, there is Tipton, Indiana now, as well as Tipton County both. And so he kind of had the last, okay, yeah, good. All right, and so this is where he's buried in Logansport. And that's why, where's John Tipton? He's in Logansport, but obviously he's played an important role in our founding. And there he is, oh, and so I have portrayed him a few times. That's the more recent portrayal of him. Um, 
So uh, that's actually with my own uh, mutton chops. For many years, I did it with, uh, this is what I did for, those were with uh, like bad <laughs> Elvis side from this that's what I That's what I had done for uh, candy. So, and that's for the Parkside historians. My daughter, Lauren, up there, she was president at the time, so yeah. I believe that's, I believe that's it. Oh, yeah, no, I'm done. Any questions? Four hundred 
and 4,000 pounds. Now that is a ton of power uh, for a piece of equipment to be able to, to pull. And the date on this photo is 1909. So uh, just, just after the turn of the century. Now the reason we needed implements like this is as these farms were not only growing in number and size, there was new soil that was being broke all throughout the Midwest and Canada and Reeves was producing these steam engines to break that soil. This is a photo from our Henry Clay collection. You can see the furrow. The gentleman right there is sitting down in one right there. This, this soil had never been uh, plowed before. The sod is holding together really, really tight. This is really hard on plows. This is really hard for steam engines to pull. And Reeves equipment excelled at doing Right here we've got one of their larger plows. This is an 18 bottom, 20 inch steam lift plow. It is using steam from the Reeves uh, engine to raise and lower those plows. Without the steam lift, you'd have to have a crew of men standing on there, lowering and raising the plows as needed. This wasn't their largest one. They built one slightly larger, 20, 20 inch bottom plow steam lift. Rather impressive. We've got a picture here on 5th Street. Uh, Tammy had a postcard that looked a little similar to this. This is around the turn of the century. We see steam engines still riding on the road. We've got about six in there, a threshing machine pulling. Luckily, the road is not paved at the time or you'd have a heck of a rumble strip down the road. <laughs> By 1910, the population of Columbus was just under 9,000 people. By 1911, the Reeves Pulley Company is employing just under 800 people. It is a large portion of the community. By 1912, their annual sales were $2.5 million. And they decided to sell to Emerson Brainingham that same year for $2.5 million. Now Emerson Brainingham went on to continue to produce the Reeves steam engines for several years with the Reeves name still on them. They were extremely popular and well liked across the United States and into Canada. Emerson Birmingham was bought out by J.I. Case. Uh, today we know that as the Case Company. Case is one of the few steam engine producers that managed to break out from the steam engine and become a competitive uh, tractor uh, builder uh, later with diesel and gasoline. At the same time that Reeves and Company was uh, underway, Marshall T., along with Gurney and M.O., his brothers, founded the Reeves Pulley Company. They initially bought the Edinburgh Pulley Company and then moved the operation to Columbus. So they didn't invent the pulley. They didn't uh, design it from scratch. They took an existing product and perfected it. So here's two examples of Reeves pulleys. The one on the left is probably just a few feet. They made them in diameter ranging from a few inches to the one on the right, over 22 feet in diameter. Only two of those were built. One was used to build the Golden Gate Bridge, and one was on display at one of the world's expositions. That is massive. So the wood split pulleys were used uh, in industrial shops and uh, agricultural barns on line shafts. That's how you power it. The United States was not quite as electrified as you would see it today. And so they used these wood split pulleys to operate um, different machinery and implements with, within buildings. So you'd have one line shaft spinning at a constant speed, and those pulleys would be belted down to other pieces of equipment. Now what's hard is if one line shaft is spinning at one specific speed, if you have uh, a device that needs to change speed, you have to change the size of the pulleys in which uh, it is spinning. And that becomes very cumbersome. You have to stop the entire op operation. Luckily, MO was very intuitive and had earlier uh, solved this problem after running into similar issues on a sawmill. He developed the first variable speed transmission. And he used that in the Moto cycle. And the motorcycle is either the fourth or fifth automobile ever produced in the United States. Built in 1896, pretty impressive. 
If you look in the upper left-hand corner, you can see two uh, circles right there. That's where the variable speed is. Other vehicles at the time, you have two speeds, zero and full speed. And I don't know about you, but driving my car at full speed or zero is not A, efficient, or be safe. So they could change speeds from about a mile and a half to 15 miles an hour, which was pretty impressive. While tinkering with it and messing with it, they realized the automobile was really loud and it was kind of stinky. And so they created another industry first, the exhaust, the muffler, uh, which another local company ended up taking to a whole other level later on, Arvin. So they made several other vehicles in this time period. They made the Big Seven, it's at seven people. They also built another uh, vehicle that was considered to be one of the first buses in the United States. Um, later on, they started working on engines. The motorcycle was not uh, operated by a Reeves engine. So here's a couple of the engines they produced, the upper left-hand corner there. That is a four-cylinder water-cooled Reeves, and below that is a four-cylinder air-cooled Reeves. Both of those engines um, had mild success. The Aero car uh, per purchased several hundred of them, and then there was a lawsuit filed against them for a variety of reasons. I think they were just unhappy that their sales weren't quite as high as they had hoped at the time. The engine in the bottom right is a two-cylinder post. We have one of those in our collection right now, the Historical Society, that was used in a 1907 Worth automobile, and it still runs today. Most notably, the Octo Auto and the Sexto Auto. Pretty, pretty simple to figure out how they came up with the names. The Octo Auto came first at a price tag of $3,200. Today's market, that's a little over $100,000. At that time, they did not have a market for a $100,000 car. <laughs> None of them sold. So they went back to the drawing board, lopped off one set of wheels, came up with a Sexto Auto, Price tag of $5,000. Obviously, they didn't sell any of those either. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have any of these in existence uh, anymore. It would be really cool. The concept behind it was really good. The more points, in co points of contact that you have on the ground, the smoother your ride's going to be. As we saw in several of the pictures earlier, roads were not like they are today. So that made a lot of sense. Uh, it's unfortunate that they didn't pan out. I believe, Tammy, do you know, is this, this street in front of one of the Reeves houses? That's what I thought. And then the bottom right is one of the Sexto Auto ads in our collection. Their last venture into engines was their stationary engines, referred to as hit and miss engines. These are personally my favorite engines. I love working with these. They ranged in size from one horsepower to 12 horsepower. They were used for a variety of reasons at the time. Once again, rural farms were not electrified. So anything that you wanted to run by today's standards with an electric motor, you needed this guy. So they're called portable at times, they're stationary. Portable is a strong word when they're weighing several thousand pounds as you get to a 12 horsepower. They were used to pump water up on houses, shell corn, grind corn. You could run a line shaft inside a barn and operate something. You could split wood, run a buzz saw. They're a lot of fun. We still teach eighth graders today how to operate these. They are a little dangerous. We haven't had any issues. We also teach eighth graders to operate the steam engines. And it's really cool seeing a 14 year old operate a 100 year old steam engine as well. So these were advertised occasionally towards women to help make housework easier. You could churn butter and make ice cream. And I'm sure they had some success with that because as any married person in here knows, a happy wife is a happy life. Unfortunately, um, the sales of this weren't quite what they were hoping. They started shifting their focus back to the variable speed transmissions. That was, became their bread and butter. This next photo here is a huge variable speed transmission. They were not all this big. They were small and they were large and every size in between. And they were used for a variety of um, implements. They, you, they were, an infinite number of things could be um, operated by with these. And Breeze is very intuitive. 
They designed them later on to run off an electric motor. So they didn't, uh, they, were, they were competing with modernization and no longer running off line shafts. I really, really like this photograph. I found it yesterday in a box that I had never opened in our collection. The gentleman in the upper right hand corner is Leo Gergen, my great grandfather. Really cool, really special to come across this. So, that's wonderful. So, the Reeves family, the Reeves Pulley Company, Reeves and Company, they really laid the foundation for a large industry to develop here in the community. Companies like Arvin and Cummins. Celeste Cummins even worked for the Reeves Pulley Company for a short period of time before branching out and starting Cummins. So, they they created a need for skilled laborers, distribution networks, and their engines, or excuse me, their variable speed transmission is still being produced today under the Reeves name through Master Power and Transmission here in Columbus. You can still purchase a product with the Reeves name on it. It's really impressive. They were not only inventors and businessmen, even though they had 150 patents between the family members, which is really good, they were also pillars of the community. They were members of city council, school board. Several of them were pastors of their churches. And they were also philanthropists, leaving behind large endowments that are still being used to better the community today. Um, they're, they're, they left a lasting legacy, helping shape and create the, the city that we all love today. So thank you very much. I'll use this. My name is David Seacrest. Um, I love Columbus history. I've been researching and writing Columbus history now for a few years. My first book was published in 2013. It was a history of the Crump Theater. It uh, won the uh, most outstanding book of the year award from the Theater Historical Society of America. In October of 2015, Tony Morbeck, hi Tony, uh, commissioned me to write a history of the pump house. The book that you have in front of you is, uh, is a, a, a group endeavor. I'm still working on a uh, more detailed, uh, more expanded version, which, fingers crossed, a uh, book will be forthcoming. And last year, um, I wanted to do a history of Donner Park or Parks and Rec. Everybody thought that 2016 was the 100th year anniversary of Donner Park. Well, through my research, I found out, nope, that wasn't the case. Uh, the, the 100th anniversary, I believe, officially is March 5th of this year. And Parks and Rec changed their, uh, their planned uh, celebration of that anniversary from last year to this year due to my research. Uh, Tonight I'm going to be talking about a building that has a commonality with everything that, that's been discussed so far, with the exception of Greg, <laughs> and that's the pump house. But before I get into the pump house, let's see here. Uh, the reason I'm standing here tonight is because of Harry McCauley. Uh, about a month ago, Bethany from Ivy Tech called and told me that uh, Harry, who was scheduled to speak, couldn't make it, and Harry recommended that I take his place. So it's an honor to be here. I'm excited. I'm nervous. It's been a while since I've talked to a group of people, but this is dedicated to Harry. So here's the pump house primer. You get it? Pump primer? <laughs> in 15 minutes or less, okay? Uh, when the pump house went online in 1820, or, um, let me get, 1871, it was called the Holly Works. It was also called the Water Works. And around 1974, 1975, people started referring to it as the pump house, and that's what we've called it since. In my personal opinion, the two most important events in Columbus history 
was the arrival of the railroad in, in 1844 and the completion of the pump house in 1871. If neither of these events had not occurred, Columbus would be a much different city than it is today. Uh, here's a map of Columbus, present day Columbus. This is just taken off Google Maps. It'll give you an indication of the size Columbus is today. Let's step back in time and take a look at an 1871 Columbus, a bird's eye view. Uh, when this map was drawn, the pump house was in operation. I don't know how to use the pointer, so I'll use my finger. There's the pump house, right there. And to put it in today's terms, uh, 1871 Columbus ran from about Water Street up to 10th, and let's say from the river to Sycamore Street, or to put it in better terms, that yellow rectangle, the kind of bottom is, uh, will give you an idea of the size of 1821 Columbus. In 1859, Brazil Holly founded his Holly Manufacturing Company, and this was a technological achievement that was just, it was crazy. He figured out how to distribute water through a series of water mains without using a reservoir. And the Holly plan quickly became the choice of installation by more than 2,000 cities across the U.S. and Canada. Am I echoing, or is it just me? Okay. Uh, the Holly plan, what it was basically, it was a suction pump operated by a steam engine by which water was drawn, in our case, from the Driftwood River and then forced through a series of conducting pipes along the various streets of Columbus. On September 27, 1870, uh, seven years after Columbus became incorporated as a city, the Common Council approved an ordinance for the construction of the town's first waterworks facility. At that time, funds were also set aside for the creation of the town's first fire department. Uh, the waterworks was tested on August 5, 1871. These testing, the, the testings of waterworks were huge affairs. Uh, they were grand events. Mayors would speak, newly formed waterworks trustees would talk, bands would play, entire towns would turn out, men and children would climb as high as they could in the tops of trees to see how high a stream of water could be shot. People would occupy the tops of buildings. It was, it was a huge, it was, it was a big deal to celebrate. The, the testing procedures were, 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 there were, were, there were various steps. Uh, the person operating the hydrant would turn the water on and off in succession uh, three times, which would cause a regulator switch at the, at the waterworks to blow a whistle, which would notify the person on duty that they needed to increase the water pressure. And then time was measured from uh, Oh, typically the water pressure in pipes was 40 PSI, how long it would take to increase the water pressure to 100 PSI, and that was usually 30 seconds or less. Next, next uh, several hoses were attached to hydrants, uh, determined if the water pressure, when all of them were turned on, could remain a constant, oh, kind of vary between 80 and 100 PSI. And the final and the most crucial step was to attach one or two 1,000 foot hoses to a hydrant and see if, uh, if the constant pressure could be kept. These tests would run for hours. Uh, I, I don't know exactly how long the test ran in Columbus, but in Covington, Kentucky, these tests ran for three hours. And what they would do is they would run the test until either the water in the waterworks well was depleted or until the machinery gave out altogether. Why was the waterworks built? One reason and one reason only, fire protection. Before the waterworks, I love this line from the paper, before, before well, the waterworks, firefighting was done by a gathering of a promiscuous mob with pails and axes. Water was drawn usually from the nearest wells. <laughs> so Columbus's first waterworks went online on September 1, 1871. It, I don't know yet if it was the first in the state of Indiana, but I do know that Columbus had a waterworks online before Indianapolis by, by about four months. 
And it was a huge selling feature for the town. I mean, you know, before branding and slogans and everything, this is an ad from the Bissell, uh, for the Bissell Hotel, New Hope Hotel, I believe, in 1875. I don't know if you, yeah, you can read this part here. You know, they were proud, Columbus, Columbus was proud of their town. They had a, a waterworks facility, they had the nicest courthouse in the, in the state, and they had the finest uh, first-class opera house. The opera house in this case was the Palace Theater, which was at the uh, southwest corner of Fifth and Washington. This is a picture of the old waterworks, the very first building, which occupied the same site as the present waterworks today. And I love this picture here. All the wood stacked up outside. You know, think about it. this. These, these were wood-fired uh, boilers, and. The amount of wood the place the place used was was unreal. Uh, a traveler coming into Columbus and crossing the bridge looked over on crossing the river and thought that the uh, the pump house was a wood yard. The waterworks, to be honest, it was a money pit. There was constant wear and tear on the boilers. Think about it. The place ran 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. They had to increase the machinery each as the city grew, and there was an unending demand for wood to fire the boilers. Uh, I think it was around 1875, 1876, they switched to coal to see if they could save money. And in 1875, they sealed all the pipes in the waterworks with uh, a thick coating of cement. And they figured that this coating and sealing of the pipe saved approximately one quart of wood every 24 hours. So the waterworks would break. It was the biggest. It was the biggest expenditure on the city's books by far for many years. It wouldn't break even or become profitable for 27 years later. But and that's a big but. The savings in human lives and personal property far outweighed any bottom line number. Columbus Waterworks provided three essential needs for a growing town. First and always most important was fire protection. Added to that, as the city grew and the years progressed, factories needed water. This was the age of steam. Factories couldn't produce product without water. And then last and not as important was the problem, was, was the situation with pure drinking water, which I'll touch on in a little bit. So fires were usually announced by the blowing of a steam locomotive in Railroad Square. And once the waterworks engineer on duty heard that, he would blow the waterworks whistle to let him know, hey, I know that I need to increase the pressure in the lines. Either that, people would run back and forth to the water house, or to the, uh, to the water works. There was no, uh, there was no, there weren't any telephones or anything like that hooked up yet. Particular fires brought about a change in policy and organization at the water works. An important fire was the Ulrich Stable Fire on sep uh, September 21, 1873. Uh, this is a Sanborn map from 1886, but it'll give you an idea of where the Ulrich Stable Fire occurred. It was the northwest quadrant of Fourth and Frank, or yeah, of Fourth and Franklin. Uh, an outbuilding caught fire and began spreading from building to building that day, and it looked so bad that people were worried that the mills north of uh, north of the fire would catch and be destroyed on both sides of Franklin Street. A couple of weeks after the Ulrich fire, Columbus's first fire company was established. Uh, think about it. These were men who volunteered, no training. This was on the job training. Uh, I love the I love the statement in the paper. The fire company, which numbered 35 men, all pledged their honor not to drink a drop of strong drink while on duty. Uh, that was pretty good. Uh, at that time, the city's first hose house was built. It was built on Railroad Square, site of First Christian Church today. Uh, it was on the south side of Fifth Street, about halfway between the block, Franklin and Lafayette. Another important fire was the Crump Opera House fire of October 18, 1873. 
This is a blow up of the 1871 map and for years that two story building sort of uh, kind of centered in the, uh, in the picture stymied me. I didn't know what in the heck it was. And uh, I think it was about three or four years ago I found out that that building was owned by Francis Crump and it was destroyed by fire on December 30th, 1870, about oh, a few months before work on the waterworks got underway. Uh, in 1872, Francis Crump built an opera house on that corner. So we're talking the corner of 4th and Washington, uh, where, where uh, the jewelry store is today. And almost a year to the day from the opening, uh, Francis Crump's opera house caught fire and a calamity of errors started. Uh, you had a newly formed fire department, and for some reason, water in the waterworks, uh, the pressure could not be built up. It took 45 minutes to build the pressure up in the water lines, and by that time, the opera house was destroyed. There was a call to run a telegraph wire from the hose house to the waterworks, after the Crump Opera House fire, but no action was taken at that time. But finally, three years later, November of 1876, a fire alarm system uh, installed between the host house and the waterworks was finally put in place, but what it was was telephones. There was a telephone at the host house and a telephone at the waterworks. And then the city's first fire alarm system was installed April 21st, 1881, which was eight years after the Crump Opera House fire. And once again, it was a series of telephones interconnected. Uh, fire Chief Henry Davy requested a, a phone be put in his residence. And the city council and waterworks trustees reluctantly agreed and agreed on the stipulation that his phone bill wouldn't uh, exceed $3 a month. <laughs> the Central Conservatory of Music Fire, this is a big one. Okay, this was a beautiful building once occupied the corner of 9th and Chestnut. Uh, on November 14th, uh, Samuel Heggie's barn caught fire. And the barn was about a half a block from the conservatory building. Firemen rushed to the scene, everything's going beautiful. They get the barn fire put out, and sparks from the barn fire caught the tower of the conservatory building ablaze. Firemen rush over, start working on the uh, conservatory building, and they find they've depleted the water and the water or the waterworks well. So they tried pumping water directly from the driftwood, and the water was so low that they couldn't get the water pressure they needed, and the Bates Conservatory building was lost to fire that day. Two days after the conservatory fire, uh, a temporary dam was built across the driftwood, basically comprised of wooden barrels filled with sand. And then a permanent dam was later built across the driftwood, completed on September 19, 1890. The pump house was uh, telling, researching and telling the story of the pump house is telling the story of Columbus itself. The two were so interconnected you know, you had all these challenges and burdens placed upon the waterworks as the city grew. Uh, as new factories came to town, they all required water. Uh, in, uh, on May 1st, 1890, uh, the city took over elect uh, the electric street lighting system. They added that burden to the waterworks. And then you had the uh, never-ending demand from industry. Uh, the ever-expanding boundaries of the city itself, and then the whole issue with pure drinking water, which was, uh, it was quite a fiasco for a number of years. And like I said earlier, the waterworks accounted for a huge uh, percentage of the city's expenditures in its early days. And then guess what? 1881 rolls around. It's my favorite year in Columbus history, 1881. And the city builds its first sewer system. And this will tie in with what Tamara was talking about earlier. The Fifth Street Sewer Project, okay? This the Fifth Street Sewers, six city sewers emptied into the mill race. Tamara brought up the mill race earlier. You can see it on this 1879 map. 
not only did the city's waste connect to the mill race, you had Moody and Sons Tannery and the Columbus Gas Works. And they all connected to the mill race, which emptied into the driftwood just above the intake pipe for the city's water supply. I, I love this. The stench arising from the old race during warm nights is horrible. It comes up so thick and offensive as to dr almost drive the men from the works into that part of the race next to the river, six of the city's sewer empty. To these are added the drains of the tannery and the gas works, mingling matter, giving off poisonous gases with liquids containing animal matter in all stages of decomposition. Other drainage adds vegetable matter, the hole under the hot sun being covered with a thick scum, green and black and rich in putridity. Can you <laughs> this is the state of the race down to and immediately over the very pipe from which our city draws its supply of water. <laughs> the first water analysis was done Right around this time, uh, January, February 1881, uh, samples from the driftwood were uh, sent to the Indiana Medical College in Indianapolis. And the water quality, this was before the sewer project, okay? The water quality on average was on average with most uh, cities across the country. And then American Starch comes along. American Starch was a huge manufacturer with a huge industry once located at the uh, northwest corner of 16th and Washington Street. They had purchased land going all the way back to the Flat Rock so they could use the water to dump their waste. Uh, American starch, I believe, start the beginning of industrial growth, but it was also a huge contributor to the problems with providing the city pure water. What they dumped as waste was gluten, and the gluten would, would uh, catch on the filter, and uh, the filter would get clogged up, and the city couldn't draw the amount of water it needed, so it would bypass the filter and use raw, raw river water. <laughs> Say that fast three times. Uh, it's funny because, well, it's not funny, but that problem suddenly went away when uh, American starch was destroyed by fire on, on April 6th, 1895. And that was another disastrous fire because they had run the water mains directly into the building and they couldn't get any pressure from any of the, from any of the hydrants uh, uh, located nearby. In 1894, 21 deaths were associated to the waterworks in a, a two-block area of the waterworks due to typo, what they call typo malarial fever. It was directly blamed on the waterworks. You know, probably city funds was the biggest thing holding back um, this this problem with the water. Um, around well, 1894, they they started the drinking fountain project. What they did is they hired John Cole in early 1893, who was a city engineer in Chicago, to come to Columbus and to do a study about artesian wells. And April 6th, the city authorized a test well to be dug at the waterworks. And then the test well was done. They sunk the pipe to 300 feet. They got pure water. And uh, on July 19th, the city abandoned the uh, the well project entirely. But what they did is they utilized the, uh, the test well that they dug, they ran new water lines to various points around downtown Columbus so that consumers and residents could get pure drinking water. 1895, it got so bad, the city considered moving the entire waterworks one mile north up on the Flat Rock River ahead of the pollution. Um, 1906, one of the, uh, 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 the filter uh, project was undertaken and it proved to be a failure. It, it didn't work. 1907, city res or the city urged residents to filter their own water. And 1909, the bacteria counts from samples of filtered water were as high as the uh, raw river water. These are some of the editorial cartoons. 
I don't, can you read the bottom? Uh, and believe me, there's quite a collection of these. Uh, what shall be done to eliminate the microbes in the city water? This is from 1905. Another one from 1905, a good barometer. Take the water which flows through the city filter. If it's clear, you know it's a fair weather. It's fair weather. If you have to take a drink with a knife and fork, then you understand there has been a rain and the filter is not filtrate, filtrating. And another one from 1905. Cannot something be done to remedy the evil? It was a serious problem. But you know, the thing was, is it wasn't as serious as providing fire protection and water to factories. Those were the two most important things about the, about the water clothes. One last one, this was a great one. 1906, a, a consumer turned on his tap and two eels come out of the water tap. So they were put on display at the Evening Republican uh, building. <laughs> Uh, May 1910, Mayor Charles Barnaby began taking a, a serious look into a, a new water purification system. And in 1912, they uh, approved construction of the city's first water, pur water purification plant. It was, uh, the water purification plant couldn't fit on the same ground as the pump house because uh, there was not enough room, so it was constructed around First and Brown Streets. It was placed on line in June of 1913. It took the city 31 years, but they finally came up with a solution that worked. This will give you uh, an idea of how important the waterworks was to the city of Columbus. Uh, at 1.30 a.m. on the morning of March 5th, a fire alarm was turned in for box 14. Uh, firefighters went and there was a fire in the, in the back of Henry and Smith's saloon. Uh, the boilers, uh, the wireworks were fired up. And under the, under the heavy pressure in the water lines, a wide fitting that the waterworks burst. The burst wide fitting shut almost every factory down in Columbus. The only two that remained open was Columbus Tool and Handle Company and Mooney's Tannery because they had backup. They had wells. And Mooney's Tannery at the time was using 25,000 gallons of water a day and they estimated that they could keep their factory open for an additional 24 hours. If it, if it went any longer than that, then they would, have, they would deplete the water in the water well and they would have to shut down as well. Jazz Crump Street Railway, it, should, it couldn't run. Uh, hotels and businesses lost uh, all of their source of heating. The courthouse had to close. That night there was no street lights, and guess what? There were no spare parts on hand. They had to order a Y fitting from Louisville, Kentucky, and in all the city was down for about 30 hours, all because of a part that cost less than $10. The pump house, that, that was not a, uh, that happened not frequently, but it happened quite often. Uh, where something happened and, and every, every, it shut down, you know, the city would come to a standstill. That's why I say the pump house was the reason Columbus grew. Uh, without the pump house, Columbus would be, would be a much different city today. It played a really important and essential role in the development and growth of Columbus. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Yeah, I don't want to stand between you and ice cream, that's for sure. So uh, my name is Dr. Stephen Gomes. I'm the uh, Chancellor of Ivy Tech Community College. And first of all, I want to say uh, thank you all for coming out. We weren't sure what kind of turnout we would have. And then when we heard who the speakers were, we just knew we would have a great turnout. So I want to thank all four of you. We have about 100 people here tonight. Uh, and for us, this is uh, one of the first times that we as a community college have offered something to the community. It's been a long time since we've done that. We want to get back to that business. So this is the first of a series. And uh, we have two more coming. We have another one on January 25th. So this was the past. That, or 29th. 25th. 25th. 
Uh, that was the past. The next one we're going to do is the present. And we have some uh, leaders in the community, uh, a couple of people that we've already named as Kathy Warren, who's with the uh, Community Education Coalition. She'll be here. And Brian Payne with our airport. So that will be some interesting uh, topic there. Then we also have in March 29th, we have our future. And we're going to have Richard McCoy here. Uh, we've still got some uh, planning to do for that. But we're going to take a look and see we've learned our past. We're going to talk about our present. Where's Columbus headed? So we think that's going to be a really interesting uh, event as well. Uh, a few people I want to thank before I let you get out of here. What we're going to do for questions, speakers, is we have just a great little area set up for ice cream and stand-up tables. We'd like for you to, to interact with them one-on-one, -on -one, ask your questions, so that'll give you all an opportunity to do that. Where are my Phi Theta Kappans in the room? Students, where are you? Stand up, please. Are they still here? Oh, they're out the side way. So we have a whole group of students. Uh, Phi Theta Kappa is our national honorary for two years. It's like Phi Beta Kappa for four years. They were involved in the process. Roshan, you can stand back up. Patrick Nevins, where are you, sir? Is he helping as well? So Roshan is a professor of communication. She helped with this event on along with those students. And then lastly, the woman in red, Bethany Messer Smith, please stand up. Please give her, she's, she's been a lion's share of the work. And I want to thank her for her so again, thank you all. We would uh, adjourn right now. Please go out front here. And uh, Zahara goes is prepared. I believe I heard a Sunday bar. So we are thrilled. And I think you can even make your own Sunday. So that's even better. So thank you again to Zahara goes and Tony for doing that. And thank you. We'll see you in January. Look at our Facebook page for updates. That's how you'll know when the next event is. Thank you.